Friday the 13th, The Jason Strain, Chapter 24. Butch sat on a padded bench on the left side of the deck, eating a weird energy bar. It was a sort of chalky, dry cocoa flavor with crispy, unidentifiable bits mixed in, but he swore it was the most delicious meal he had ever had. He was in a lot of pain and felt a little feverish and more than a little exhausted, but he was alive and the warm breeze felt good on his skin. He finished the energy bar and, unsure of what to do with the wrapper, went to stick it into the pocket of the loose-fitting khaki pants he had found stuffed below the bench and slipped on to avoid having to sit around wearing only the space blankets. He discovered that there was a slim leather wallet already in the hip pocket. Curious, he removed it and opened it up. The Illinois driver's license read Lawrence T. Fisher, height 6 foot, weight 220, eyes blue, hair blonde. He wore corrective lenses and was an organ donor. The photo was surly and unflattering, but Butch recognized the diver who had been introduced as Larry, the one who hadn't made it. The wallet also contained two credit cards, a discount card from a chain pet store, a punch card that allowed you to get a free car wash once all the spaces were punched out, and a rental card from a video store. There was some Costa Rican and American cash and a fortune from a Chinese cookie that read, Take time to enjoy the simple things in life. Inside a plastic sleeve was a photograph. It showed the late Larry and the tall, red-haired lady in a low-cut top. They were both flushed and flashing big, goofy smiles at the camera. They stood back to back with their sleeves pulled up and arms pressed together, showing off identical tattoos of old-fashioned swallows. On the back of the photo, in slender feminine hand, were the words, Bye-bye, Blackbird. Come home soon or I'll kill you. Love, Charlotte. Suddenly, Butch didn't feel quite so good to be alive anymore. Stella walked across the deck, compensating gracefully for the swaying floor by shifting her weight from one leg to the other, while her hips and upper body stayed steady as a rock. She had dressed in black fatigue pants and a white tank top, through which the dark nipples of her small high breasts were clearly visible. Her feet were bare, toenails painted, a deep, flawless burgundy. Her hair was shorter than his, barely more than dark stubble on her sleek and elegant head, and her sinuous mouth was turned up in a catty smirk. She held two sweating bottles of purified water in one hand and sat down beside him. How many of these have you had? she asked, putting one of the bottles in his hand and cracking the other to take a swig. Two, Butch replied, opening the offered bottle. But I feel like I need twenty more. You do, Stella said. Breathing compressed air dehydrates the hell out of you. She took another sip. Funny, isn't it? Getting dehydrated underwater? How's your leg? It hurts, Butch replied. But you should see the other guy. I did, Stella said. I can't believe you knocked out a hammerhead shark. I should have learned my lesson back when I lost 50 bucks on your first fight against Troy Amerland. But from now on, she put her hand on Butch's thigh. I'm betting on you, Butcher. You knew me all this time, Butch asked, looking down at her hand on his leg and frowning slightly. Oh, I thought you looked familiar, Stella said, but when I saw you blast that shark, I knew it was you. Butch shrugged, feeling more than a little awkward. There's a shower down below, Stella said, sliding her hand higher up his leg. Hot water and everything. Want me to show you where it is? Predictably, it was at that moment when Alex appeared from below deck. She also held a bottle of water, and her green eyes were blazing furiously with jealousy and poison. I thought you could use some more water, Alex said to Butch, but I see you already have some. Stella took her hand off Butch's leg and held her palms up in mock surrender. Oh, I'm sorry, she said. Are you two? No, Alex said vehemently and turned to walk away. Stella raised an eyebrow at Butch. I'll take that as a big yes, she said. See you later, Butcher. Butch sighed, finished up the last of the water, and went to find Alex. She was standing at the bow, leaning far out over the railing. The wind was whipping her dark hair around her face, and her shoulders and arms were starting to look a little sunburned. She had found some fatigues like Stella's, and they hung so low on her hip bones that only the firm bubble of her ass was preventing them from falling off. She was beautiful and fuming. Alex, he said softly. Just forget it, she said, not turning around. It doesn't matter. Come on, Alex, he said. 
Don't be like this. He reached out to touch her and she shook him off. He clenched his jaw and backed off, feeling a low surge of anger. Why did she run so hot and cold on him like this? And more importantly, why did it bother him so much? Well, he knew the answer to that one, but he couldn't deal with the tangle of emotion, so he turned and limped back to the bench, calf throbbing in time with his heartbeat. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Tig called from the helm, this is your captain speaking. Buckle your seatbelts as it looks like we're in for a bumpy ride. Butch headed up to see what was going on. He found Stella already there with a pair of high-powered binoculars, looking off at the distant shore. Tig had his t-shirt off and wrapped around his head like a turban, and a cigarette parked in one corner of his mouth. His entire back was covered with a huge Japanese-style tattoo of a snarling tiger. His side was thickly bandaged. Looks like we're late for the party, Tig said, gesturing with his chin toward the shore. Shit, Val said, appearing on top of the ladder. They're on the mainland too, huh? Butch could see fires dotting the beach and crowds of people writhing and struggling, flailing in the shallow water. There were large crimson streaks on the white sand, and a jeep lay upside down, burning. Great, Butch said. Now what? Stella took the binoculars from her eyes and scowled. Head south, down around the peninsula, she said. Look for some place less populated to land and make our way back to... She looked down at the GPS locator on her wrist. Manuel Antonio. That's going to add at least a day to the trip, Tig said. Probably more like two or three with conditions the way they are. More if we have to walk the whole way. You got a better idea? Stella asked. Tig said nothing, steering the boat due south. Every beach they hit seemed filled with more bloody madness. In some places, floating clots of infected people drifted dangerously close, and more than one actually got a grip on the dive platform and tried to climb aboard until Stella or Val stepped in and cut off their heads. It wasn't until they had almost given up completely that they came across a tiny curl of beach hidden by rough rocks. The beach looked deserted and they were starting to get low on fresh water. This would have to do. They anchored the boat and geared up. Stella gave them gloves, boots, goggles, and respirators. She made sure that each person took a full canteen and a backpack. Butch glanced into his pack and saw several more energy bars, a sturdy flashlight, bug repellent, and a bunch of other things he did not recognize in sealed plastic containers. Stella also doled out weapons. She tossed Butch's shotgun and two heavy boxes of shells. Ever fire one of these? Butch shook his head. She handed a second shotgun to Alex. Val, Stella said. Show them how to load. Right, Val replied, taking the heavy gun from Butch and checking it over with the casual, unthinking economy of movement that said she had been doing this her whole life. If things are hot, which they probably will be, you're going to want to use the combat load. She slid the action open, exposing a rectangular hole in the side of the barrel. Almost too fast to see, she palmed one of the green shells, slid it under and around the barrel and into the hole, smartly snapping closed the action. Good to go, she said. Now you do it. Keep the business end pointed toward the threat the whole time and make sure you put the cartridge in the right way. Remember, she tapped the brass cap at one end of the shell. The brass end is the ass end. Make sure the brass is pointed towards you in the chamber or you'll be really unhappy. Got it? Right, Butch said, feeling less confident in his ability to mimic her magician sleight of hand smoothness with this deadly weapon. Still, Butch performed the motion a few times until he felt a little less like an idiot. He then watched Alex as she fumbled to slide the shell into the hole, big hands awkward and shaking. The look of concentration and determination on her face as she tried again and again made Butch suddenly wonder if she was still mad at him. Butch looked around as everyone prepared to pile into the slender, inflatable dinghy that would take them to the shore. They looked pretty badass, almost like they knew what they were doing. Bao had a high-powered rifle and two handguns. Tig and Stella had rifles, too. Everyone had a machete, but Butch was already starting to sweat in the heavy protective gear, and it would be worse once they got on the mainland. He wanted to believe that it would work, that they would make it somehow against all odds but he wished he felt more sure. He wished Alex would smile at him in case he was about to get killed or she was. 
The thought was more than he could take. He clenched his jaw and got into the dinghy. The rocky beach was pristine and deserted except for some leggy birds and a single cantankerous iguana who lifted his chin defiantly at them as they passed. There was a path leading up into the trees, but it was barely more than a pig trail, so narrow they had to walk single file. As soon as the jungle closed around them, the suffocating heat wrapped itself around Butch's head like an alien face hugger. Do we have to wear those respirator things? Alex asked. You don't want to get infected blood in your mouth or nose, do you? Stella said. I need windshield wipers on my goggles, Butch said. They're dripping with sweat. We haven't even seen anyone infected, Alex said. Not yet, Stella said. They found that the trail ended at the side of a fairly large paved road. Of course, it was paved only in that it was less than 50% potholes, but not by much. Stella took the lead, and they all headed roughly north. The numbing sameness of the winding road, the virulent green jungle around them, and the lack of any sign of humans, infected or otherwise, started to wear on Butch. His bitten calf hurt, his feet hurt, and he was hot and cranky. He almost found himself longing for an attack, to relieve the mind-deadening monotony. It wasn't easy to be understood through the respirators, but Butch didn't feel much like talking anyway. Never in a million years would he have imagined that he would find himself bored in the midst of a nightmare like this. Eventually, after what felt like a century of hiking, they finally came upon a small roadside stand, barely more than a rusty tin roof held up by four crooked poles. There were a few crates of fruit stacked out front, more than one of which had been knocked over. Green coconuts and smashed mangoes were scattered all over the road. Several creatures like big, leggy, tellus rats were feasting on the broken fruit and chattering to each other, but they scattered as soon as they saw the human visitors. There were also some bins of what appeared to be used auto parts, stacks of dented mufflers, and an ice chest full of beer and strange soft drinks that Butch had never heard of. There was a tin sign advertising Bavaria beer, hanging as if drunk, from a single chain while the broken chain on the other side swung back and forth with the sound like an unquiet spirit in a cheesy old cartoon. The place was deserted except for a single corpse, possibly female, though it was difficult to be sure. She was headless and sprawled out on the side of the road. For an absurd moment, Butch thought she was dressed in a gaudy, sequined Miss America gown, but when he looked again, he realized that she was actually covered in shimmering green flies. She lay beside an ancient red jeep, door hanging open as if she had tried to reach it and failed. Her head was nowhere to be seen. Stella went to the jeep and cranked the ignition. No dice. No gas, guys, she said. Is there a generator we can siphon? Tig was rooting through the little shack, filling his pack with cold beer and cigarettes. Don't think so. The cooler's full of ice, though. He pulled down his respirator and cracked a bottle of Bavaria, draining it in three gulps. Better drink up while it's cold, folks. Tig held a beer can out to Stella. She shrugged and took it. Might as well, since no one is trying to eat us at the moment. Butch? Tig asked, holding out a beer. No thanks, man, Butch said. I guess I'll take one of them sodas, though. Tasmarindo or Jamaica? Tig asked, studying the painted labels of a pair of old-fashioned bottles. I have no idea, Butch said. Just give me the red one. I'll take one of them beers, Val said. Tig handed her a Bavaria. Alex? Tig asked. I'll have that other soda, she replied. A Tamarindo girl, are you? Tig asked. Coming right up? They all stood around drinking in introspective silence, still keeping a paranoid eye on the jungle all around them. Butch pulled off his respirator to take a sip of the lurid red soda and was immediately sorry. The rotten stench of dead flesh wormed its way deep into his nostrils, tainting the flavor of the drink and making him more than a little queasy. He gulped the soda down as quickly as possible and put the respirator back on. But it was as if the smell had coated the inside of his sinuses, filling his head with that brutal, toothy reek. He did not want to throw the empty bottle on the ground, so he went looking for a trash barrel. There wasn't anything that looked even remotely close, so he set the bottle in one of the fruit crates, figuring it was better than nothing. When he looked up, he noticed a huge toucan perched on a low branch to his right, not ten feet away. 
The bird was giving him the hairy eyeball and clacked its beak furiously at him. Something like that didn't even seem real. Like a creature made up by the Nature Channel. How could it even fly with that huge preposterous beak? Anyway, it gave him something else to look at besides the dead woman in her shimmering fly gown. Okay, folks, Stella said, squatting and extracting a radio from her backpack. Since we have a minute, let's see if we can pick up any military broadcast. Then I want to keep heading north along this road and see if we can score some kind of vehicle. We need to find a safe place to make camp pretty soon. We only have a few more hours of light. She turned on the radio and started fooling with the dials. Butch heard nothing but static until a slow, slightly befuddled American voice manifested out of the white noise. If anybody is out there, the voice said, this is smoke and it would be great if you could, like, answer. Stella looked up at Tig. What do you think? Whoever it is, they might have a vehicle, Tig replied, or gasoline. Or they might be looking to steal guns or equipment, Val said. Capture and rape women? Jeez, Alex said. You really believe the worst of everybody, don't you? I haven't been proven wrong yet, Val replied. Yeah, Alex said. Well, what about us? Quiet, Stella said. Then into the radio. We copy you, Smoke. What is your current position? Over? <laughs> oh, wow, the voice on the radio replied. Wow, okay, yeah. Like, I'm like about 15 kilometers outside of Puerto Jimenez. Right on the edge of uh, Corcovado, man. Stella consulted her GPS and nodded. We're less than five clicks south from Corcovado, she said. What's the best way to reach you? Over. Wow, the voice said again, and Val rolled her eyes dramatically. Like, I guess you'd want to take the coast road there, since it's pretty much the only road. And, um, go a little ways till you see this big rock that kind of looks like a Volkswagen Beetle. There's an unmarked road there that you can, like, totally take for a while. And then, okay, Stella cut in. Look, have you got any flares? Um... The voice trailed off. I don't know about this, Tig said. The guy sounds like a real space case. Stella shrugged, and then the voice came back on. Yeah, I got one left, the voice said. I don't know, it's kind of old looking, but maybe it still works. I'm going to shoot it now, okay? A bright ball of fire arced up into the air a few miles to the northwest. We see you, Smoke, Stella said. We're on the way, over. Okay, man, the voice said. That's great, but hey, like, be careful, because there's all these really uncool, wigged out people around. Everybody is, like, really sick and freaking out on some kind of bad trip or something. I'm, like, the only one left, but it's safe in here, totally safe. If you want to come by and kick it for a little while, it's safe. Copy that, Smoke, Stella said, over and out. She turned off the radio. Great, Val said. Sounds like a total waste of time. We need a vehicle and more supplies, Stella said. Guy sounds like an easy mark. We can hole up there for the night and make up for lost time in the morning. Come on, gear up, kids. Butch nodded and followed, trying to hold the shotgun like he meant business. It was a long, arduous walk along a twisting secondary road that switched back on itself again and again. It rained buckets for almost exactly two minutes, long enough to drench them to the skin and then stopped as if shut off like a faucet. Butch was drowning in sweat and trying to ignore that dull pain chewing at his calf with every step. His wet clothes felt heavy. They passed several little dwellings barely more solid than the roadside stand and deserted except for occasional dogs, chickens, or curious monkeys. Torn laundry streaked with blood and dirt flapped on clotheslines. A bicycle lay on its side in the center of the road. A black and white striped bird with a startled expression and a punk rock haircut sat on one of the upturned wheels. No humans were anywhere. It was eerie how quickly the jungle was creeping in to reclaim the cleared spaces, now that the humans who cleared them were gone. In a few weeks, it would be as if they were never there. As they got closer and closer to the source of the flare, they began to hear disturbing sounds, hissing, scraping, and frantic scrabbling. I guess everyone else had the same idea as we did, Stella said. This must be the place to be. Look alive, people. Here we go. Butch thought he would get used to this eventually, or at least numb to the horror and sickening dread that washed over him when confronted with the infected. But it hit him totally fresh and vivid every time.
When they rounded the bend and came upon a walled compound, there were crazed infected people throwing themselves with psychotic determination against the brightly painted walls, leaving behind thick smears of blood and vomit that blended badly with the psychedelic swirls of kindergarten colors. There was a large garden area to the left and several fruit trees to the right. The compound looked to be L-shaped, but the wall was too high to tell what was inside. Large solar panels topped the far side of the wall. There was a sort of driveway, barely more than a pair of deep wheel ruts, leading up to a large wrought iron gate with a moon on one side and a sun on the other. The gate was backed with sheet metal, so it was not possible to reach through the bars. Looks like he's got a vehicle of some kind in there, Stella said, gesturing to the wide wheel tracks. Looks pretty big, whatever it is, Tig replied. A sudden high-pitched shriek made Butch jump and raise the barrel of his shotgun toward the source of the sound. Something flew past his head, but he could not see anyone in the trees and did not want to start randomly shooting and attract attention from all the infected people around the wall. There was a sudden wet smack to his left, and he turned to see what had happened. God damn it, Val cursed, wiping brown slime from her goggles. Fucking monkeys! Alex sniggered as Val struggled to clear the monkey shit from her goggles. But the infected people were already turning eager faces toward the sound of Val's curse. They were rapidly abandoning their mad finger painting and heading straight for Val. Val, Tig, Stella said. Go for knees. Butch and Alex, blow their fucking heads off. You got it, Captain, Tig said, taking out the knee of a swiftly moving man in a Hawaiian shirt. Tigga on the trigger, baby. Val narrowed her eyes and tightened her lips, annoyed as she kneecapped a second man. This one shirtless and wearing tight black knee-length shorts. He did not go down until she took out his other knee. The guy in the Hawaiian shirt was crawling, reaching for Butch's boot. Butch put the barrel of the shotgun against the top of his head and pulled the trigger. The noise was loud and the kick of the big weapon felt like a punch in the shoulder. The guy's head blew apart like a ripe watermelon, and he twitched for a few seconds and then went still. Still, I got on the radio. Smoke, do you copy? she said between the gunshots. We're here, outside your compound. Open the gate. Over. I can hear you, Smoke replied. Get closer in, okay? I'll drop down a ladder as you can climb up. Copy that, Stella said, over and out. The people swarming, swarming toward them were an odd assortment of local police, Ticos, some surfer types, and two or three older tourists in cute, matching Patagonia outfits, now hopelessly torn and soiled. They fought their way through the infected crowd. Butch found himself using the barrel of the shotgun as a club more often than he fired the thing. But he was proud of himself for pulling off that combat load that Val had showed them. He had grabbed another shell from his pocket and was about to try again when he heard Val call out, Hey, watch out! Butch stepped back as a woman reached for him. Startled, his foot punched through the leaves and branches beneath a loose scattering of dirt. Off balance, arms waving wildly, he dropped the shotgun and toppled backward into a deep hole. The wind was knocked out of him. Butch was not alone. In the dim light at the bottom of the pit, he could make out a scrawny Tico in a filthy blue shirt and worn black dress slacks, squatting in the far corner. The man's long hair was wild and clotted with blood, and his eyes were swollen to the size of gory tennis balls in his skeletal face. It took a second for the Tico to register Butch's presence, and when he did, he threw himself across the deep grave-shaped pit, hissing and snarling. Butch dodged to the right, yanked the guy's t-shirt up over his head, and pinned him against the wall with his boot in the center of his back. Butch wedged himself against the opposite side of the pit, keeping the guy trapped against the wall, facing away and scrabbling madly at the dirt. Could use a little help down here, he called. He heard another volley of shots and then Tig's voice. Leave him, he said. It's too dangerous. Fuck that, Alex said. To Butcher's surprise, Tig came suddenly crashing down into the pit, almost as if Alex had pushed him in. He nearly fell on top of Butch, knocking both Butch and the infected Tico aside. Gee, thanks, Butch said to Tig, helping him to his feet. Don't mention it, Tig said dodging to one side as the still-blinded Tico lunged toward him. Butch grabbed the Tico from behind and knocked him down onto the ground. He grabbed the man's kicking feet up under his armpits and tied him up in a Boston crab. Tig unsheathed his machete and chopped the Tico's head off. 
Look, Tig said, suddenly sheepish as he wiped the machete blade on the headless man's pant leg. Sorry about, you know, about Le saying Leap. Just sorry, man. No problem, Butch said, lacing his fingers together to give Tig a leg up. Shall we? Right, Tig said, and stepped on the bridge of Butch's hands. He lifted Tig up and out. Then he saw Alex's goggled face appear at the rim of the pit. Come on, she called, holding down her hand for him to grab. He took her hand and was again amazed at her raw strength as she pulled him up and out of the pit. Thanks, Butch said. I owe you another one. I've lost track, Alex said. Let's just not get killed, okay? Right, Butch agreed. Another wave of the infected charged around the side of the compound. This assault of the dead consisted mostly of women, all disturbingly young and formerly pretty. When one dived at Butch, he turned and swiftly hip-tossed her down into the open pit. A second was on him almost at once, but Alex was right there, shoved the barrel of her shotgun into the open hissing mouth and pulled the trigger. The hot rain of gore that covered them both made Butch glad he was wearing protective clothing. No matter how sweaty and uncomfortable it was, it was like showering in brains. The four of them were battling their way toward the gate. Tig continued to kneecap the oncoming infected, while Val used her machete to methodically chop off each head. Hey, Stella called. Butch looked up to see a blonde, wildly dreadlocked head poking up over the wall, slightly to the left of the gate. Watch out for those traps, the blonde called, pointing to the open pit. Great, thanks, Butch replied turning to kick back a maniacal fat woman in a bloody sundress. Could you drop down that ladder now, pal? Oh, yeah, right. The blonde head disappeared and reappeared seconds later to drop down a rope ladder with painted wooden rungs like something a kid would make to get up to his treehouse. Don't let any of those freaky people crawl up after you, though, okay? Okay. Stella pushed Alex toward the ladder. Go, go, go! Alex started climbing swiftly and as soon as she was halfway up, Stella shoved Butch toward the ladder. He started climbing, his bitten calf aching every time he used that leg to take a step higher. Hey, man, the blonde guy said, smoked, presumably, when Butch reached the top. Like, welcome. How's it going? Butch asked. Alex was there beside him on the top of the wall, and without even realizing he was doing it, he reached out and took her hand. She did not hit him or pull away, and he felt suddenly almost too exhausted to stand. Val was next, followed by Tig and Stella. Stella was climbing backward, fighting back an infected farmer in a ratty straw hat. He was clutching at her with long, sinewy arms as she struggled to kick and climb at the same time. Come on, Alex said, gripping one side of the ladder. Pull! Butch grabbed the other side of the ladder and they hauled Stella up. When the infected farmer clutched at the top edge of the wall, scrambling to pull himself up after Stella, she turned and neatly lopped his hand off. The farmer fell to the ground, hat flying backwards off his head. His severed hand bounced comically off his forehead and landed in his upside-down hat. Two points, Tig said, high-fiving Stella. Like, let's go on down now, guys, Smoke said, pointing to a fixed wooden ladder on the inside of the compound wall. Everything's totally cool. Butch seriously doubted that everything was totally cool, but he made his way down the ladder anyways. When he reached the bottom and removed his respirator, he was immediately assailed with a heavy miasma of incense, patchouli, armpit funk, and animal dung. There were colorful little chickens strutting around the dirt yard, and a single floppy-eared goat regarded Butch curiously out of strange horizontal pupils. Within the compound's walls were three buildings, one large and two smaller. The larger building had an awful painting on the front that looked like a bad mural sketched by third graders. The building on the left looked like a garage of sorts, because the wheel tracks led up to a big tarp-covered lump inside. Probably a Volkswagen bus or some other kind of hippie mobile, Butch figured. He didn't exactly know what the other building was, but there was an open-air kitchen in front and Butch could hear a low rhythmic thumping coming from the inside. It took Butch a second to realize that the shiny red door of the building was set right between the chubby spread legs of a painting, a giant fat woman with the sun for a head. Oh, just lovely. The dreadlocked guy was spreading his arms wide and trying to get everyone's attention. Butch noticed that the guy was wearing a sort of a skirt, 
like a sheer tie-dyed sarong and nothing else. He had a million different beads, bells, feathers, and things woven in his blonde dreadlocks, making him look like a human cat toy. He was tall and thin, with big wooden plugs in his stretched-out earlobes, and way too many necklaces. Okay, everybody, he said. If it would be okay, I'd like you all to listen to me for a minute. Go ahead, kid, Stella said. Okay, cool, he replied. First of all, it would be a good idea if everybody took off their bloody infected clothing and shoes and stuff. Just take it off over here. I'll get things for you guys to wear while we boil your infected suit. Unless you feel like going sky clad, which would be totally cool too. It's okay, because shyness about our bodies is like a totally artificial construct of modern society. The dreadlock guy disappeared around the back of the central building, and Alex looked at Butch with a frown. Skyclad? she asked. He means naked, Tig said, stripping off his boots and outer shirt. But you know, I, I wouldn't want to scare the white girls. He winked at Val, who glowered and turned away. Leave your gloves on till last, Stella said, unselfconsciously dropping her pants and revealing the sheer purple thong beneath. Butch looked away quickly before Alex got upset again. Eventually, they had all stripped down to nothing and stood away from the pile of contaminated clothing and gear, trying not to look at each other and feeling extremely foolish. The dreadlock guy returned with an armful of what appeared to be different pieces of batiked fabric. He handed out the pieces and Butch examined what he had been given. It was a large purple rectangle of cloth with fringe on both ends and a design that might have either been turtles or striped footballs. What the hell are we supposed to do with these? Alex asked, holding up a pink and yellow tie-dyed scrap. Just like wrap it around your bodies. Here, like this, the guy said, demonstrating with his own sarong. Like this? Butch asked, skeptical, wrapping the cloth around his waist like a towel. Yeah, man, that's it, the dreadlock guy said, nodding approvingly. Really tubular perfect. Butch felt ridiculous, but he was too damn tired to care. Alex came over to him and tightened the knot around his waist, smiling a little. You look like you're ready for some kind of luau or something, she said. All you need is a necklace of leaves and flowers. Shall I make you some? She looked pretty funny in her outfit, too. She had tied the cloth around her body above her breast, and it was barely long enough to cover the lower curve of her ass. I feel beat to shit, Butch said. I need to lay down for a minute. Alex nodded and took his arm. There were some musty cushions scattered around in the shade beneath a small tree. Butch let Alex lead him over and sit him down. He sprawled out with his head pillowed on her firm, muscular thigh, and she touched the back of his head with a tentative hand. He watched Smoke helping Tig with his appropriately tiger-striped sarong for a little while. But before he knew it, Butch was fast asleep. Chapter 25 Alex's leg was starting to feel drowsy, so she gently extracted herself, left Butch snoozing beneath the tree, and went to find the others to see what was going on. There were several huge vats filled with their bloody clothing, presumably boiling on the kerosene burners in the outdoor kitchen. Stella and the others were gathered around the garage-like building, tart pulled aside to reveal a huge, curiously modified vehicle, that might have once been a van of some description. It resembled a bizarre post-apocalyptic mini-tank, as if hippies had carjacked the Landmaster from Damnation Alley to go to Woodstock, or it had been inspired by the Dead Reckoning in George A. Romero's Land of the Dead. It was half-painted with the same bad childish swirls as the outside walls. I was kind of thinking that me and my wives could, like, drive down to Panama, Smoke was saying, we could find that canal and get a boat or something. How long did it take you to come up with that plan? Stella asked, kicking the vehicle's fat, dusty tires. Well, he frowned and trailed off. I I'm sorry, Tig said. Did you say wives as in plural, as in more than one? It's not like I really have two wives, Smoke said, making his point by shaping the air with long, slender hands. I am like an equal partner in a loving polyamorous relationship. Honeymoon's got some Three's Company action going on, Tig said. So where are Janet and Chrissy anyway? Oh, it's not like that, Smoke said, scowling. Yeah, Stella said. Where are they? I thought you said you were alone here. 
Okay, like, uh, j listen up, everybody, Smoke said. Don't freak out or nothing. Just don't. He took them around to the red door into the side of the kitchen building, below the painting of the big, fat, naked lady. This is the women's house, he said. It's supposed to be a sacred female-only space, but these are uh, special circumstances, so... He opened the door between the painted fat lady's thighs, and Alex covered her mouth and nose as a powerful stink washed over her. Inside were two women. One was thick and chubby with blonde dreadlocks like smokes. The other was tall and skinny with short, dark, pixie haircuts. They were both naked and bound with gags made from rubber tires, jammed between their teeth. They were also infected, and the hot stench of rotting blood coming from their bodies hit Alex like a sledgehammer, making her gag. This is Earth and Layla, he said. My wives? Jesus, Stella said. Why are you keeping them in here? Why don't you cut off their heads and put them out of their misery? Oh, I couldn't do that, Smoke said. I love them. I can, said Val, unsheathing her machete. No, 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 Smoke cried. Listen, here's the deal. If you want to take my vehicle, we have to bring them too. Maybe your scientist friend can, like, cure them or something. No way, Stella said. No fucking way, we'll walk. Hey, wait, listen, listen, Smoke said. I can see how you might think it's a bad idea and all, but they can't hurt you. We can bundle them up in plastic tarps and they won't bother anybody. You're way more likely to get hurt walking. He does have a point, Tig said. Without wheels, we're pretty much fucked. I mean, Smoke said, looking down in the way. You guys have all these guns, so you can, like, take my vehicle if you wanted to go that way. But I'd really rather you didn't. I'll help you. I made dinner for everybody and stuff. I really don't want to be, like, left behind. Stella sighed and shook her head reluctantly. Okay, look, we can pack them in the back, but I want someone watching them at all times. First sign of trouble, she made a throat-slashing motion across her neck, like the running out of air sign. Alex was starting to feel like she really was running out of air. Nothing made sense anymore. I'm sorry, Alex said. Science, his friend? What's he talking about? Stella looked at Alex and then at Smoke. Come on. They left the women's house, and the bound and writhing wives were left behind as they stepped back out into the more gentle stink of animals and incense. Here's the deal, Stella said. We'll take you and your wives to Dr. Kane, but if they or you become a burden, even for a minute, we leave your ass behind, got it? Who the hell is Dr. Kane? Alex interjected. Dr. Kane is the one who is going to fix everything, Stella said. She can remove your camera rigs, and she's working on an antivirus right now to put a stop to this fucking nightmare. The plan is to get back to her lab in Dart's compound up near Chiripo. From there, she says she has a new and better way to recapture Jason. He's the carrier, the key to this whole mess. The idea that there was some kind of authority at the other end of this crazy quest made Alex feel simultaneously relieved and anxious. The last time there were authority figures ready to fix everything, it hadn't gone so well. She seriously hoped that this mythical Dr. Kane had better luck than the soldiers on the island. Smoke had apparently spent the time that they were making their way toward the compound, cooking a big pot of something vegetarian and spicy. It actually wasn't bad at all, but perhaps she was biased because it was the first hot meal she'd had in what felt like a million years. She wolfed down two large helpings and then refilled her bowl. She went to see if Butch was hungry. It was dark and she needed to use the flashlight from her pack to find her way back to the little tree. Hey, she said softly, squatting down beside Butch. I thought you might be hungry. Butch sat up, wild-eyed and startled. He put a hand to his temple and groaned. Thanks, he replied, taking the bowl and spoon. But let's go inside, okay? I'm the one getting eaten out here. They went into the main house. It was all one big room with no furniture except for a few low tables and a bunch more cushions. Smoke was already asleep in a hammock strung up in the far corner. Stella and Tig had curled up together in a nest of cushions, and Val was sitting at one of the low tables, field stripping her rifle by the light of a Coleman lantern. Alex led Butch to another table, and they sat together in silence while Butch ate. 
Alex used her flashlight to dig through her backpack until she found some bug bite cream and rubbed the stuff into the welts, where hungry mosquitoes had feasted on his back, arms, and his legs. Get some rest, you two, Val said, putting the reassembled rifle on the table and turning down the lantern. This may be your last chance for safe sleep. Alex gathered up some cushions and a patchwork quilt that smelled like wood smoke and sandalwood and lay Butch down, covering him like a child. Alex, he said, hand on her arm. Stay with me. She looked down at him and nodded. She switched off the flashlight and the darkness closed in around them. It was so black that she had to feel her way over to him. She slid beneath the thin quilt and he put his arms around her, pulling her close and resting his head against her breasts. His body felt hot and feverish against hers. Things are so strange, Alex, he whispered. I don't know anything anymore. Shh, she replied. It doesn't matter. Alex knew this was a bad idea, that she was losing her battle to stay distant and independent. But after everything they'd been through, nothing else seemed real besides the feel of his breath on her skin and his arms around her. She touched his rough, stubbly cheek and turned his face up to kiss her. She did not stop him. She couldn't. Instead, she kissed him back with a slow, powerful passion building inside of her. They were in a room full of other people, covered only by a thin blanket, but it was like nothing else or no one else existed, like they were the only ones left on the whole planet. The flimsy scraps of fabric wrapped around their bodies easily fell away, and this time it was achingly slow and fierce, barely moving and drinking each other's breath. After she held him close as he whispered to her, told her everything about his mother, about his grandmother and Ace and the women in the hotel. She knew in her heart that he was innocent. He was a good man, the first good man she had ever known, and she realized she would do anything to help him, that she loved him, whether she liked it or not. Promise you won't leave me, Butch said, voice drowsy and already half asleep. I couldn't stand it if you left me. I promise, Alex said though he was already asleep. As soon as the dawn sky began to slide gently from purple to pink, Stella was up and on everyone to get moving. Butch woke up with Alex's back pressed against his belly and her firm, muscular ass moving sleepily against him. It was extremely difficult to make himself pull away and get up. As he went off to the outhouse for a piss, he started to remember more about the night before. He was appalled at how intense his feelings for Alex had become. He never meant to open up to her like that to expose all his soft spots, his weaknesses, everything. He hadn't shared so much of himself with anyone in his life, not even Ace, who had been closer than family to him. He felt awkward, uneasy, and he had no one to blame but himself. When he came back into the main house, Alex wasn't there. She must have been getting cleaned up. Butch was almost glad that he did not have to face her yet. Smoke was already awake and had brewed a huge pot of fantastic, rich, and pungent coffee. It was the best Butch had ever tasted and made their lunatic plan to find this mythical Dr. Kane seem almost feasible. Got any milk? Tig asked, rubbing the sleep from his eyes and holding a large unglazed cup covered in astrological signs. Ask Astera, Smoke said. Who? Smoke smiled and gestured to the black and white nanny goat. Are you kidding? Tig shook his head. I'll take it black, thanks. What do you say, Astara, Val said, holding out a handful of granola. The goat ate contentedly out of Val's hand. When Astara had eaten all of the granola, Val reached down and grabbed a hold of one of the goat's long, sagging teats and squeezed a foamy jet of milk into her own cup. Hippie cappuccino, she said, taking a swig. Butch shuddered. He liked his coffee black, so he didn't care, but it still seemed somehow, well, less than hygienic. Whatever else she might have said about smoke, he was a good host and an excellent cook. He fussed around everyone like a mother hen. He even baked fresh muffins in the wood-burning oven, though they were a little odd, with kind of a vegan, hippie flavor to them. Still, they beat the energy bars all to hell, never mind the fucking ant eggs. Butch watched smoke going around refilling everyone's coffee and making sure everyone got enough to eat. It was obviously really hard for him to be alone. Butch scrubbed down with refreshing peppermint soap and dressed in his still damp but clean clothes. He saw Alex standing over by the gate with a cup of coffee. 
She had washed her hair and bound it back in a gleaming braid. She wore the fatigues in a tank top that had not yet put on the long sleeve shirt. Her muscular arms and shoulders glistened with sunscreen and bug repellent. She turned back and gave him a shy little smile that seemed odd coming from such a powerful woman. Stella had the curious vehicle all packed up and ready when Smoke called Butch and Tig over to the kitchen. Like, okay, Smoke said, let's get Earth and Layla wrapped up in these tarps. He scooped up a handful of olive drab plastic sheeting and get them in the back of the bus. Smoke had changed into something approaching normal men's clothing. Though everything was in wild, mismatched colors, almost like a child imitating their protective gear out of Grandma's dress-up trunk. Green and purple striped pants, a cotton long sleeve shirt with embroidered detailing on the collar and cuffs, clunky red Doc Martin boots, and what looked like women's gardening gloves with a pattern of jaunty vegetables. Amazingly, he had his own expensive and heavy-duty respirator and goggles. Alex had told Butch about the infected wives, but it didn't prepare him for the sight of them bound and gagged and slick with blood like the stars of some heinous snuff film. He felt much better once they were covered with the plastic. At that point, they could have been sacks of animated laundry. Butch hefted his assigned bundle and carried it to the open back doors of the vehicle. Ready? Stella asked as Smoke climbed in behind the wheel. Like, I'm totally ready, Smoke said. Butch, unlock the chain. Smoke tossed Butch a key on a beaded necklace. Tig, Val, and Alex climbed into the vehicle while Butch unlocked the chain. He could feel infected people yanking on the gate from the outside. And as soon as the chain was off, they wrenched it partway open and started reaching through. Shit, Butch said, dodging back and out of reach. Come on, Alex said. Butch dived into the open side door of the vehicle and Alex slammed it shut behind him. Seconds later, a skinny infected woman threw herself at the side of the vehicle, hissing and clawing. Smoke floored it and hit the partially open gates. The gates flew wide, one side knocked loose from its hinges, and they barreled down the rough driveway. Inside the vehicle, they all bounced around like ping pong balls in a tin can. Calabunga! Smoke let out a crazed squeal of delight and punched a cassette player in the dash. Butch was expecting the Grateful Dead or Fish, but what came blasting through the crackly old speakers was Nine Inch Nails, head like a hole. The grinding industrial beat was weirdly appropriate, as the berserk infected threw themselves at the vehicle and were mowed down. Behind the wheel, Smoke had apparently left his apologetic vegan peacenik ways behind, and actually seemed to take a mimic joy in swerving to take the bastards out. As Smoke sped down the driveway, the infected ran behind the vehicle like stray dogs, and then, one by one, they each gave up and dropped back. We lost them, Val reported from her seat in the back. Outstanding, Stella said. Good job, Smoke. Smoke laughed and gave her the thumbs up. We should be able to reach Dr. Kane's lab before sundown, Tig said, provided we don't run... He didn't have time to finish the sentence as the bulky vehicle skidded on a turn and slammed down hard into a ditch. The wheel spun uselessly, spraying mud into the air. Oh, wow, Smoke said. I always bought him out in this ditch. Fuck, Stella said. What do we do now? Get out and push? Well, Smoke said, I usually walk over to Ferd's place and see if he'll drive me out with a winch and give me a hand. Okay, Stella said. How far is his place? Oh, about two or three hours, Smoke replied. Which way? Smoke pointed back the way they came. Great, Stella rolled her eyes. How do you know he'll be there? Well, I guess he won't, Smoke said, since you cut his hand off yesterday. But we could try to, like, hotwire his truck. You know how to do all that secret spy stuff, right? It'll only, it'll only fit three people in the cab, though. And I guess nobody wants to ride in the bed, so, like, some of us should wait here with Earth and Layla while the other ones get the truck. He beamed like he was immensely proud of his brilliant plan. The whole time, while Smoke was reeling off strategic genius, Val was clenching and unclenching her fist and looking as if she was getting ready to shoot him. The atmosphere inside the stuffy vehicle was unbearably tense. Alex pointed out the back window. Look, she said, horses! There was a small corral on the outer side of the road, about 50 yards down. 
Inside were three horses, two brown and one white. One of the brown ones was dragging a headless corpse, tangled in one of the stirrups. It looked like there were one or two more corpses around the edges of the corral, but no infected people that Butch could see. Three horses, Stella said. If we double up, we can do it. Anyone know how to ride? Before Val could pipe up, Stella cut her off. Yeah, I know, Val. Of course you do. Anyone else? I can, Alex said. I'm no expert or nothing, but I used to ride when I was a kid. Well, okay then, Stella said. Let's divvy up the supplies. I want Butch with Alex, Tig, you're with me, and Val, you get Mr. fucking Mad Max here. No way. Uh-uh, Smoke said. I can't leave Earth and Layla. Then you're on your own, Val. Stella started filling up and checking the packs, tossing one to Butch. Ready? Butch took the pack she handed him and looked over at Alex, who was staring out through the mud-splattered window. Go, Stella said. She kicked open the back doors of the vehicle and they sprinted across the road. Val hit the fence first and climbed up and over. Alex followed and Butch was right behind her. He was amazed to see that the wooden fence posts were actually growing. New green leaves were sprouting up from the cut top of each one. It never ceased to amaze how alive everything was out here. Life itself was something you could actually feel, like sunshine or the flow of water. And in some awful way, that Jason guy was almost like the opposite of that green and vigorous life force, like death personified, but utterly unnatural in its manifestation. Somehow, in this virulently living environment, Jason's death force had spilled out and infected everything around him. Just like these dead fence posts were striving to become full green trees again, the victims cut down by Jason were infected by his evil and struggling to come back. It didn't seem possible, but there was no denying the reality of what was happening. Maybe the scientists they were looking for would have some kind of rational explanation. Guys, Smoke called, Hey guys, wait up! Butch turned back to see Smoke running toward them, waving his arms. From the far side of the truck, there was a blur of movement, and then suddenly a fat, horribly sunburned man in tight little shorts, and nothing else, came barreling towards Smoke. He was obviously infected, sporting the now familiar bulging, bleeding eyes and large, showy wounds that would have been fatal for a normal person. A huge, fatty slash ran from his collarbone, through his large, almost womanish chest, and down into his belly. He was also missing an ear and a large flap of skin from his cheek, revealing two rows of brownish, tobacco-stained teeth. Look out! Stella called, but Tig already had a bead on the advancing man and blew out first one leg, then the other. He fell and Smoke jumped from his reaching grasp. Smoke flew across the road like his ass was on fire. Shit, he said when he reached and vaulted the fence. Shit, like this really sucks, man. Butch could see that he was terrified and torn up about leaving the women. He was probably a liability, but Butch couldn't think of a fellow human that way. Like, when we get the cure, Smoke was saying as they crept slowly toward the horses, I'll come back. I'll totally come back for them. Sure you will, Butch said. I can't help them by getting killed, right? Right, Butch said. Smoke threw a glance back at the goofy, useless vehicle. The back doors were open and Butch could see the two women squirming in their tarps, like some kind of giant larva. He shuddered and put a hand on Smoke's skinny shoulder. It's okay, man, Butch said. Smoke nodded like a little kid trying to be brave. Go with Val, okay? Butch said. Yeah, Smoke said. Okay. There were three more corpses, all still and dead. One looked as if he had been trampled by the horses, neck broken and ribs sticking up through the fabric of his formerly white shirt. The other two were missing their heads. All three horses were anxious about the dead bodies and skittish from the gunshots. The white mare didn't have a saddle, only a bridle. Val was walking slowly up to her, making soft, soothing sounds and holding her hand out. The white mare turned her head, regarding Val with one wide, suspicious eye. Shit, Stella said, here comes another one. This new infected person looked as if it had been run over by a truck. It was so badly crushed and broken that it was impossible to tell its gender. It was crawling through the long grass toward them, spitting and wheezing. Alex raised the barrel of her shotgun. No, wait, Val said. 
but the bloody, pathetic thing was reaching for Alex's leg. Alex pulled the trigger. The horse bolted. Val swore and leapt up onto one of the more placid brown horses, taking off after the fleeing white mare. The white mare could not actually get away since the cor corral fence was too high to jump, but she ran around and around in wild panic circles. Val rode the brown horse up beside the terrified white mare, and to everyone's amazement, she leapt from the saddle, landing firmly on the white mare's unsaddled back. The mare bucked and twisted, but Val held firm until it settled to a low trot. Holding the reins of both horses, Val rode over to where the rest of them stood. Saddle up, cowpokes, Val said. Alex took the reins of the brown horse Val had ridden and climbed into the saddle. Stella took the other brown one, cutting free the tangled corpse and mounting up, helping Tig up behind her. Val extended her hand to Smoke, and he awkwardly scrambled up behind her. Alex had her, held her hand down to Butch. Come on. The ride was uneventful, beautiful even as they wound higher and higher into the mountains. They easily outran the handful of infected people they came across and seemed to be making excellent progress until they came to a large multi-car pileup blocking the road on a blind curve. At least one car had smashed through the guardrail and tumbled down the sheer edge of the mountain, smashing to bits on the rocks below. On the narrow road before them was a large upturned truck, a smaller pickup laying on its side with a bloated corpse hanging half out the shattered windshield, and one of those little rented tourist jeeps, its front end smashed and hood crumpled up, so that Butch could not see the occupants. Even through his respirator he could smell the stench of death. So could the horses, and they were clearly not happy about it, especially the white one. They danced backward away from the crash and whinnied anxiously. There was no clearance at all on the right, as the big truck was flush up against the high rock wall blocking it. On the left was the drop. There was maybe a foot and a half of space between the pickup truck and the edge. Okay, kids, Stella said. We dismount and lead the horses slow and careful, everybody, okay? Butch had never really given much thought to fear of heights. He remembered visiting the stratosphere in Vegas and feeling a kind of nervous excitement looking out over the edge of the observation deck. But he had been there with the burlesque dancer named Cha-Cha, and his mind was on other things. Looking over the crumbling edge and dizzying drop, he felt a creeping kind of terror coiling in his belly. Can't we climb over the trucks? he asked, hating how wimpy that sounded. Well, Stella said, some of us can, sure, but someone needs to lead the horses around. She won't go with anyone else, Val said, dismounting off her white mirror and helping Smoke down. I'll lead her around and Smoke can climb over. Right, said Smoke. I like climb over. Butch and Alex got down off their brown gelding and looked at each other. I'll do it. I'll do it, they said in unison. Butch shook his head and Alex laughed. No, really, Butch said. Let me. He reached for the horse's reins and Alex shook her head. No way, tough guy. You help Smoke. Stella had already started leading her own brown mare along the tiny strip of road between the pickup and the edge. Butch could hear little pebbles and clots of dirt sliding down the cliff. His heart clenched tight in his chest. Okay, he said, but be careful. Alex nodded and took the reins from Butch's hand. He watched her turn and follow Val and the white mare, then turned and started climbing up the side of the pickup. He reached down to help Smoke and Tig was right behind him. Then, as they were making the tricky step from the side of the truck to the crumpled hood of the jeep, the driver's side door of the jeep flew open, and a slick, bloody hand reached up and grabbed Smoke's pant leg. He hollered and fell awkwardly, impelling his throat on the jagged, broken windshield wiper. Butch saw the other end of the wiper punching through the back of Smoke's neck. The bells in his dreadlocks jingled merrily as he shuddered and died. Shit! Tig shouted, wrestling furiously with the new attacker. The guy was taller and broader than Butch but nearly skeletal, his face like a skull dipped in red and white wax. Before Butch could even react, Tig and the infected man were falling, tumbling together over the edge. Butch shouted and threw himself over the jeep and into the road on the far side. Stella, Val, and Alex were already on the other side, and Stella was on her knees at the edge, cursing. When Butch looked over the edge, he saw Tig caught on a little outcrop of rock. 
The bone in his right leg was protruding from his thigh, blood soaking the leg of his pants. He had lost his rifle and pack in the fall and was moaning, only semi-conscious, but still alive and not infected. Oh my God, Alex said. Look! The infected man was below, clinging desperately to handfuls of brush and struggling to climb high enough to reach Tig. We've got to do something, Butch said, opening and closing his fists. His leg is broken, Stella said through clenched teeth. He won't make it. But we can't leave him, Alex said. He's still alive. Stella put her rifle to her shoulder and fired a single shot. Tig's head rocked back in a burst of crimson, and then he was still. No, he isn't, Stella said. Now let's go. Butch turned away nauseous. Tig, who would have left Butch behind in the trap. Tig, with his bad jokes and his tiger tattoo. Really, Butch didn't know a thing about him. But he felt a hollow sense of hopeless loss now that he was dead. And smoke, too, for that matter. The goofy hippie, who sounded like a ninja turtle, who made good coffee and didn't want to be alone. So many people. It was all starting to overwhelm Butch. He felt like he needed a nap. His hands were shaking. Some action, Hero. He got back up on the horse behind Alex. Stella and Val were moving along, each alone on their respective mounts. It started to rain. They all rode on in silence. Okay, this has been chapters 24 and 25 of Friday the 13th, The Jason Strain. I gotta admit, this is the first uh, upload from this book that I was not impressed with. These two chapters seem like filler. There wasn't a whole lot of story movement. And for 50 pages, they really didn't get very far, you know. It seemed like the uh, author was just trying to fill up the 400, the 400 pages that were mandatory for the authors that were selected to write these 25th anniversary books. Yeah, I found out all you had to do to be one of the authors in this series was turn in a one-page pitch with like part of a chapter of the story you want to tell, and New Line would agree to it or greenlight it based on that one-page draft thing, one page of part of a chapter. That's it. That was the prerequisite right there. That, and you had to make a 400-page story at least. You know, so Hell Lake, I don't, wow, Hell Lake got made because of these lax uh, prerequisites from New Line back in 2005. You know, there was a couple cool parts in Hell Lake with uh, Jason and everything. That's probably what the guy turned in was just that cool part. He, like, made sure not to throw in the, the Jason using a rifle and all that. Anyways, I'm off topic here. There's not much left of this book, about 57 pages. I'll try to squeeze it all into one upload. I'm not sure if I'll be doing a narration of the book tomorrow, because at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time tomorrow, I'll be doing a live stream announcing our Facebook contest winner and doing the 1,000 subscriber celebration drawing giveaway. I'll be doing the drawing live during the stream. There's four winners. If you want the details on it, Go to my uh, videos on this channel and find one of the 1K Celebration Details videos. Alright guys, until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying, thanks for listening and have a great day. <laughs>